All right, good afternoon. Um, this morning at the Africa event, the Secretary General expressed his solidarity with the people of Somalia after the brutal attacks in Mogadishu and said there must be total unity of action against terrorism in Somalia and around the world. As you know, we issued yesterday a statement in which the Secretary General strongly condemned the attack and reiterated the UN support for the country. He also tweeted out that he was disgusted by these unprecedented attacks and said his condolences to the victims and wishes those who survived a quick recovery. The Secretary General urges all Somalis to unite in the fight against terrorism and violent extremism and to work together in building a functional and inclusive federal state. The African Union mission in Somalia, UNISOM, and the UN family at large are providing support to the government's response to secure the area and provide, um, and provide help for the search and rescue as well as rebel clearance. UNICEF has delivered antibiotics and medical supplies to the two Mogadishu hospitals today. And the UN Mine Action Service, technical advisors, medics, and explosive detecting dogs have been deployed to the blast site. UN staff are also participating in a blood drive. And uh, as I mentioned, the Secretary General spoke at the uh, high-level inaugural event of Africa Week. The international community must change the way it looks at the African continent, he said. Africa is a land of resilience. Above all, it is a land of opportunity. He highlighted the recent progress made by the con continent in reducing poverty, di diversifying economies and building the middle class, and nurturing growth in a variety of sectors. The Secretary General stressed that the shared challenge of the UN and the African continent is to build on those gains and to continue working to achieve the sustainable development goals. As part of Africa Week here, there'll be a series of discussions, briefings, and side events. The full program is available on the internet. And this morning in Fiji, the Deputy Secretary General spoke at an event on partnership held uh, ahead of the climate change pre-COP meeting with the Conference of Parties. She told the participants uh, that the, she told participants that the pre-COP takes place against a backdrop of a distressing period of extreme weather events that have brought misery and economic damage to many people from Asia and to the Caribbean and to Central America and the United States, underscoring the importance to tackle climate change and increase countries' resilience to its impact. While the risks rise, so too do the momentum for change. She said that noting the Paris Agreement continues to gain support from all sectors of society and from across the planet. Still much more can be done. She pointed to the participation of business and investors to help speed up progress. By the 2019 Climate Summit, we must be able to show that climate action works and that transformation is well underway, she said. And as so we have been asked this morning about the situation in and around Kirkuk, and I can tell you that, of course, the Secretary General is following very closely the developments in Kirkuk Governorate. He appeals to the federal government and the Kurdistan regional government to take coordinated steps to prevent and avoid further clashes, escalation, or breakdown of law and order. The Secretary General calls on the parties to jointly manage the situation and resolve all outstanding issues through dialogue in a manner that is consistent with the Constitution of Iraq. And our humanitarian colleagues in Iraq tell us that the military movement um, in northern Iraq have displaced thousands of families from Kirkuk since yesterday evening. The exact number of people who have been displaced are still being confirmed. So far, two civilians have been caught in crossfire at a displacement camp in Kirkuk Governorate. Aid workers are mobilizing and stressing the need for access to all those in need of help. They're also calling on the parties to ensure that civilians are protected and can leave the area if they choose to do so. And turning to Syria, yesterday, UN International Committee of the Red Cross Syrian Red Arab Red Crescent interagency convoy delivered assistance to 1,500 men, women, and children remaining in the besieged Al Kabun area in Damascus. Kabun was besieged in April of this year and is the first access to the besieged area since April. The UN continues to call for safe, unimpeded, and sustained access to close to 3 million people in hard to reach and in 10 besieged areas, including the facilitation of medical evacuations in line with international humanitarian and human rights law. And this afternoon, Nikolai Mladenov, the UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, met with the Palestinian Prime Minister, Ramdi Hamdallah, to discuss the implementation of an intra-Palestinian agreement that was signed in Cairo on October 12th. 
He noted the agreement provides for the return of the crossing of, uh, of Gaza to the Palestinian Authority by November 1st, the timely effective implementation of this provision and concrete steps to alleviate humanitarian crisis will be critical to effectively empower the Palestinian government in Gaza. The UN will continue working with the Palestinian leadership, Egypt and the region in support of this process, which is critical for reaching a negotiated two-state solution and sustainable peace. And in a joint statement, three senior UN officials today are urging stepped-up support to the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, a situation they call the world's fastest-growing refugee crisis and major humanitarian emergency. And those officials include the High uh, Commissioner for uh, Refugees, uh, Filippo Grandi, the Emergency Relief Coordinator, Mark Lowcock, and the head of the UN Migration Agency, uh, Bill Swing. They said that the Bangladeshi government, local aid groups, the UN NGOs are working in overdrive when much more support is needed. Efforts must be scaled up and expanded to ensure that the more than half a million refugees are provided with basic shelter and basic living conditions with vulnerable people arriving with very little in Bangladesh every day. Pledging conference that will take place on October 23rd in Geneva provides governments around the world with an opportunity to show their solidarity and share responsibility. The statement called on the international community to intensify efforts to bring a peaceful solution to the plight of the Rohingyas, to end the desperate exodus, to support host communities, and to ensure that conditions that will allow for refugees' eventual voluntary return in safety and dignity. He, the statement also noted that the origins and thus the solutions of this crisis lie in Myanmar. Full statement is on, online, and on terms of numbers, we can report that a number of Rohingya refugees who have fled Myanmar to Bangladesh since the 25th of August has now reached 537,000 people. And as you know, the Under Secretary General for Political Affairs, Jeff Feltman, is currently in Myanmar, and we hope to have an update to share with you uh, by tomorrow. And today is World Food Day, and in, uh, Pope Francis participated in the global ceremony held at the FAO headquarters in Rome. He called for governments around the world to collaborate to make migration a safer and voluntary choice, arguing that assuring food security for all requires tackling climate change and ending conflicts. The FAO Director General, das, uh, Jose Graziano da Silva, also stressed the need to address root causes of migration, such as poverty, food insecurity, inequality, unemployment, and a lack of social protection. And tomorrow I will be joined by Richard College, the editor of the UN Population Fund's uh, State of the World Population Report 2017. He'll brief you on the launch of the report entitled Worlds Apart, Reproductive Health and Rights in an Age of Inequality. And after we're done here, uh, my friend Brendan will brief you on behalf of the PGA. Halas, Mr. Abedi. Thank you, Stefan. As you indicated, the, uh, the Secretary General during the uh, in his speech to the uh, Africa Week uh, gathering said that the international community must change the way it looks at the continent. Does he, does he mean that it should, they should, the international community should look at the continent as a rich continent or a poor continent? I think what does should, he mean exactly? I think he, he, what, what he said is that it, the narrative about Africa should change, and people should look at Africa as, an as a continent of opportunity where we've seen growth and we've seen progress in many, sec in many sectors, and not uh, just see a negative narrative as we often see it. Yes, Brittany. Okay. Um, the Amnesty International, I think yesterday, did issue a statement about the August post-election crisis in Kenya. And in this statement, they stated that 33 um, 33 people had been killed during the post-election conflict. And I am wondering, right now the country is already still tensed and, you know, the likelihood, there's, even in the report they said there, there's a likelihood of, you know, more crisis to happen. What's the UN intervention to this to avert more people from dying? I think obviously for us the, the violence that we've seen is of, is of great concern. Uh, it is important that there be a, um, a, a dialogue between all the political actors in Kenya. And we've also seen the report from uh, various human rights groups, and I think it's important that, uh, that there be full accountability uh, 
for those uh, for those victims and for the families of the victims to ensure that those who are responsible uh, for these killings are held to account. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Stefan. What steps does the SG plan on taking regarding the atrocities currently being committed by the government of Cameroon against the Anglophone minority group? And also, has the SG considered or does he plan on invoking Article 99 of the UN Charter to engage the Security Council? I think we've, uh, we have expressed repeatedly our concern of the situation in, uh, in Cameroon. Uh, the Secretary General and his senior advisors have had uh, contacts at various uh, levels with Cameroonian uh, authorities. It's a situation we continue to watch, uh, to watch very closely. Um, and it's important. Uh, we also had discussions about a possible visit <coughs> by uh, Francois Lansani Fall, the Secretary General Special uh, Representative for, uh, for, Central, uh, for Central Africa. Um, and there needs to be, uh, again, there needs to be a uh, sustained dialogue between the various parties. Same time. Yes, uh, I'll come back to you. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Uh, last Friday, there was the elections of the UNESCO Director General, where uh, former French Culture Minister Audrey Azoulay uh, won. Uh, right after the elections uh, finished, outside of the chamber of the Executive Council, it was televised, a, a man hysterically chanting, Vive la France, down with Qatar or no Qatar and later he was removed by UN security. Egypt, a spokesperson for the Egyptian Ministry of Foreign Affairs denied that this uh, person is part of the permanent uh, delegation or uh, an Egyptian diplomat. Uh, later was reported he is of Egyptian origin. His name is Mr. Uh, Abdel Hamid, Salah Abdel Hamid. However, and he identifies himself, or he, it was reported in the Egyptian state uh, news agency, MENA, that he is an advisor at the European Union. The question is, how this person managed to get to the chamber of the, uh, or outside of the chamber of the Executive Council on the UNESCO I, premises, and who sponsored his past? I, I, th those are questions that need to be addressed to UNESCO. I, 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 I have as, already as, said as, to UNESCO, right, and I haven't as, heard as anything As you know, UNESCO is a, um, is a specialized agency. They have their own rules and, and procedure. It's, it's something we have uh, no comment or no authority to comment on. Again, it's, these are issues and questions. That I mean, are, is there any way to get an answer since the, you're not really and returning the emails? Well, I can uh, see if... Uh, questions are being, I can try to find uh, people to answer those questions, but it is not up to me to speak to this issue. Ms. Mr. Abadi. What does the Secretary General think of the selection of Ms. Azoulay as the next executive? Well, first of all, I think the, uh, the, the process uh, has yet to be officially uh, completed. Um, so we will wait for the process to be officially completed and for, uh, for UNESCO to go through its, um, its, its process, uh, but obviously uh, the selection of a new head of a specialized agency is in the hands of the, of the member states, and the Secretary General looks forward to working uh, with the new head of UNESCO once that person is confirmed. Mr. Lee. Sure, thanks a lot. I wanted to, I mean, I'd, on Cameroon, since we've heard now for this fall visit for almost two weeks since the mass killings of October 1st, I wanted to ask you, over the weekend a mass grave was found near Buea, and documents have emerged of people being summoned into the police and what's it's reported is that people are being told what to say and not to say if and when which is i guess it's now when u.n investigators arrive so i just wonder is the u.n aware of this how do you explain that if, if mr fall was going to go like it's a, it's an extremely serious situation is there some the ambassador here said that there's no reason for him to go you're saying he's, he's totally welcome it's just a matter of dates where, is it the problem with Mr. Fall's schedule or the Cameroonian right, schedule? The, because uh, people are as, any, as any visit from a senior UN official uh, or anyone from the UN, it needs to be done in agreement uh, with the government. So, so his team that went there before, I'd asked you this before, mm -hmm. is it possible to know the level at which they were and if they in fact went to Buea, Bemenda, the city in which see what bodies I, I'll are see being what I, found? I'll see what I can get. Okay. I wanted, if, okay. Go ahead, one no, more. Actually, no, I have more than one. I, I wanted to, okay, if there's only going to be one more, I'll go with this one. Um, there's a, you know, I had asked you about the, the budget. Uh, Farhan sent me a few links. Uh, there's an ACABQ report on the, the Secretary General's budget proposal. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they say is that there's a lack of clarity in these dollar, they say that he's, they say, and I'm just going to do this from memory, although I have, yeah. there's seven 
dollar a year undersecretary generals or assistant undersecretary generals, but that there's a generalized lack of clarity of the actual cost to the system in terms of supporting mm -hmm. them. So I wanted to know what's the secretary general or the secretariat's response? Can't, will, will the disclosure that's being requested be made public? And the, the ACABQ document is also uh, critical of the hiring of consultants, such as I asked you about in the case of DPI. You'd say whatever, whether or not there's a procurement process, they're saying that there's a need to show only in the most extreme circumstances should these consultants be hired. And what is DPI's presentation of the, what is the extreme circumstance? And does it involve the upcoming trip to CAR, which was also discussed in this town hall meeting? No, I don't think it involves the upcoming trip to CAR. I'll try to get something for you from, uh, from DPI. Obviously, whenever the ACABQ raises questions uh, of the Secretariat, those questions are, are answered. Um, on the issue of the of the envoys, I think the the, the Secretary General uh, since the beginning has had in mind uh, to streamline uh, the number of special envoys, including dollar a year envoys. And I think most of most of the envoys were giving a year uh, extension of contract to give time for the Secretary General to look at the system uh, and the cost benefit analysis uh, of having these dollar a year envoys. Yes, Garland. Um, thank you, Steph. This is regarding Syria, and I was wondering what the latest developments are regarding the status of, of uh, political talks. Uh, when I think Mr. Dimitrov has something else to announce, he will do so. He's continuing his wide-ranging consultation. To be I, fair, we'll give you one more. Thanks, so I, I appreciate that. No, well, actually, I'll now go procedural again. I saw as a, as a, as I was being escorted to the Human Rights Council vote, the Secretary General's uh, podium or rostrum being being set up in front of the Security Council. So, was had there been a plan for a stakeout and? It's what would be the would it, would it have well, been once the stakeouts are are confirmed once sure. they are announced right but once I, they're once you're setting it up it seems like well you know this things things go all, a lot of things go uh, go on below the water line and this when they, we're ready the when we're ready this to emerge we emerge uh, I will leave you um, in fine hands with the water uh, and good waters with Mr. Varma.